On February 15, 2006, nightclub co-owner Lem Hock Soon was sleeping on a mattress in his apartment's living room when Tun Chor Jean walked in and shot him six times while his family was at home. Tun then fled the scene after the murder. The news shocked the nation as not only a murderer was loose, he was armed. No one would expect gun violence could happen in Singapore, a country that has one of the strictest gun laws in the world. As Tun was blind in one eye, he was nicknamed One-Eyed Dragon by the media. Before I go into the case, I think it would be better for me to take some time to explain a little bit of Singapore. It will help you understand the case better. Singapore, officially the Republic of Singapore, is a sovereign island country and city-state in maritime Southeast Asia. With a land mass of about 730 square kilometers, it ranked the 20th smallest country in the world. Singapore's population is almost 6 million. It has the third highest population density in the world. With a multicultural population and recognizing the need to respect cultural identities of the major ethnic groups within the nation, Singapore has four official languages, English, Malay, Mandarin, and Tamil. Singapore is the only country in the Asian region that uses English as a working language. Multiracialism is enshrined in the Constitution and continues to shape national policies in education, housing, and politics. Singapore is sometimes called the fine city, but this title has a double meaning that you don't want to be on the wrong end of. The label refers to one is that it's a fine city to live in, while the second refers to its infamously harsh fine system designed to keep the country in shipshape order. Singapore is also known for its impeccable cleanliness and low crime rate. Singapore has a reputation for being one of the safest cities in the world. Violent crime in Singapore is rare. As of 2021, such crimes accounted for 9 per 100,000 population. One reason for this could be the harsh penalties for offenders, as well as a strict ban on weapons for those not in law enforcement. Until today, Singapore still carries out capital punishment for crimes such as murder and the illegal possession of firearms. Such crimes would carry the death penalty. The island nation's high levels of safety and security is frequently touted as a point of pride by citizens and politicians. Singapore's safety can be attributed to the strict gun laws on firearms which govern it. With this, it is no surprise that any incidents involving guns would rock the nation. Tun Chor Jean aka Tony Keo was born on March 29, 1966 to migrant parents from Guangdong, a province in southeast China. His parents worked as food stall owners when immigrated to Singapore in the 1950s. Tun has seven siblings, and he is the youngest of the seven children in his family. Coming from a poor family, Tun did not have a chance to finish his school. Since childhood, Tun learned that only fight and through the act of violence would get what he wanted. Hence, getting into trouble became part of Tun's life from a young age. In his teenage years, he was recruited and became a secret society member of Aung Sung Tong. Aung Sung Tong is a secret society based in Singapore and Malaysia which existed since the 1950s and had a vast criminal network in trafficking drugs and arms and both illegal money lending and gambling. After becoming a member of the gang, Tun had also engaged in such activities. He also engaged in a career as an illegal bookie who collected horse racing and football bets at coffee shops. Young, brutal, ruthless, and fearless, in no time, Tun became one of the prominent gang members. He rose through the ranks and became a feared triad leader of the underworld. As the Aung Sung Tong gang existed in Singapore and Malaysia, this provided an opportunity for Tun to travel between Singapore and Malaysia frequently. After frequently visiting Malaysia, Tun saw an opportunity to do business there, hence began to open a shop that sold traditional Chinese medicine in Malaysia. 
He later expanded the business into a branch of four shops and also expanded into the trade of Chinese religious products and pensions. He became affluent enough to own branded cars. In the 1980s, Tun was sentenced to five years in prison for gang-related activities, including rioting and fighting. When he was in prison, Tun was well-behaved and spent most of his time studying. As such, he was released from prison after finishing serving his sentence. In 1999, Tun was involved in a traffic accident. During the crash, the broken glass pieces from the vehicle blinded his right eye. After recovering from the accident, he was no longer fit to be the leader of the gang, hence he stepped down, but still remained as a gang member. After stepping down as the gang leader, Tun continued to be involved in illegal gambling. In 2001, Tun was married to his Malaysian girlfriend Seo Fong Fong, 15 years his junior. Although after his marriage he was living with his wife and in-laws in Malaysia, he still maintained a house in Singapore at Hogang. Though Tun already had a very successful business in Malaysia, he did not stop his illegal gambling activities. This was how he crossed paths with Lim Hak Soon. Lim was married to his wife, Kok Pui Lang, and they had a daughter. Lim was a partner of a high-end nightclub, and he was also involved in illegal betting. As such, Tun and Lim became good friends, as there was more and more illegal betting between them, conflicts and disputes over money started surfacing. In 2003, Lim brought a friend to Johor Bahru in Malaysia to meet Tun. Lim asked Tun to repay him a 30,000 Singapore dollars interest-free loan. But Tun told Lim that he did not have the money and asked Lim to give him more time to raise the funds to repay him. Like the usual debt collectors did, Lim threatened Tun before leaving Johor Bahru and returned to Singapore. To Tun, as the formal headman of a powerful secret society in Singapore, he felt his ego was hurt when Lim brought a man and asked him to return the money. He could not accept Lim's disrespectfulness and out of anger, Tun wanted to give Lim a lesson. In July 2005, Tun contacted his friend in Thailand to get him a gun. Later, at a Johor hotel in Malaysia, he paid his friend from Thailand 15,000 Malaysian ringgit for a semi-automatic Beretta .22 caliber pistol. He kept the pistol in his Malaysia house and did not use it until February 14, 2006. At that time, Tun was facing a lot of financial troubles as he had lost a lot of money to illegal betting on football and horse racing. When a man is in need of money, he would lose his sense of logic and could do whatever to get the money he needs without considering the consequences. Although he still owed Lim 30,000 Singapore dollars, but to Tun, Lim owed him more than the 30,000 Singapore dollars because Lim had hurt his ego by confronting and threatening him about the outstanding loan. So he wanted to get money from Lim as compensation for hurting his ego. There is no information why Tun waited three years long then took the action of his revenge on Lim as the confrontation was happened in 2003. He picked up his phone and called his friend Ho Yuan Kong aka Motang. Tun regularly used Motang as his driver to chauffeur him between Singapore and Malaysia. After hanging up the phone, Tun packed up his pistol and some bullets. On February 14th, Tun and Motang entered Singapore via Woodlands Checkpoint at 4.45 p.m. and they went to his secret society's friend, James Tun's house at Hogang Avenue 10. Later that day, they met Lim Chung Chui, also known as A Chui, for dinner and started drinking at 8 p.m. at Braddell Road and returned to James's house at 3 a.m. Tun then asked A Chui to drive him to Lim's house. Lim lived with his wife, Joey Lim, and his 13-year-old daughter in a flat at Sarangu. On February 15, 2006, Lim and Joey returned home at about 3 a.m. from his nightclub. Nothing was unusual. Joey was very tired after a long day out, hence she went to sleep in the master bedroom. Lim was not used to sleeping immediately after returning home. He stayed in the living room and watched television shows. Fifteen minutes later, Tun showed up at Lim's house. Surprised by Tun's unexpected visit, Lim was shocked and furious. When met Lim face to face in front of Lim's house, Tun asked to borrow more money. 
Immediately, Lim rejected Tun's request. Without other choice, Tun left Lim's house with empty hands. Lim was surprised that Tun knew where he lived as he had never given his address to Tun before. To vent his frustration, he made a call to his friend and told his friend about it. He then continued to watch television until he fell asleep in the living room. After leaving Lim's house, Tun went back to Achui's car and they returned to James's house. At James's house, they continued to drink while watching a football match on television. At 6 a.m. on February 15, 2006, Tun told Ah Chui to drive him back to Lim's house again. At this point, Tun was very furious and back in his mind, he wanted to rob Lim and even murder him if he did not get what he wanted. At 6 a.m., Lim's daughter woke up and prepared herself for school. At 6.55 a.m., Lim's daughter opened the front door, sat down, and put on her shoes. Suddenly, Tun appeared in front of her with a knife in his right hand and a gun in his left. He then pushed her into the house and told her that he was there to rob. At that time, Risa, Lim's domestic helper from Indonesia walking out from the kitchen to the living room was petrified when she saw Tun. While inside the house, Tun saw Lim was sleeping in the living room, he used his right hand to wake Lim up. Feeling something was poking him, Lim woke up and was shocked to see Tun. He asked Tun what he wanted. Tun replied, I have a gun. Do you want me to pull the trigger? Tun then proceeded to rob them by asking Lim's wife, Joey, to put all the valuables into the blue denim bag he carried with him. To make sure he could control all of them, Tun asked Lim to get some ropes to tie his family up. Now, when my research reached this part, I found the story rather hilarious. Lim went to the kitchen to look for ropes, but came back with some towels instead. I cannot imagine how to tie up a person with towels, but this indeed happened. Holding four towels on hands, Lim told Tun that was what he had. Without other options, he asked Lim to tie the three ladies up with towels. Lim proceeded to tie Reese's hands at the front and also her legs. He then tied his daughter and Joey's hands at the front. Tun and Lim then went to the study room. They started arguing about the money and the loans. The argument was so loud that the ladies could hear them. After a while, Tun returned to the master bedroom and told the ladies to go to the study room. In the study room, Tun asked Lim to open the safe and put all the valuables into the white plastic bag. So the white plastic bag now contained about $170,000 in cash and valuables, including assorted jewelry for Rolex watches and stacks of foreign currencies. Satisfied with what he was able to get, Tun then handed a television cable to Joey and told her to tie Lim's hands up. Joey could still move her tied hands somewhat and managed to tie her husband's hands at the front. As she had difficulty tightening the knot, she also used her teeth to pull the ends together. The three ladies were then separated into two rooms. Risa was alone. Joey and her daughter were together in the master bedroom. At this time, Tun had gotten what he wanted, the money. But he still did not stop. He wanted Lem to beg him. He wanted Lim to taste the same awful feeling he had when his ego was hurt by Lim. He confronted Lim and again both of them engaged in a heated row, while arguing Tun raised his left hand and pointed the gun at Lim's face. Tun fired a shot at close range. The shot hit Lim's right cheek. He then fired another five shots. One shot missed Lim, but the other four shots hit his left thigh, left arm, back, and right temple. Lim was killed instantly. Before leaving the scene, Tun went to the master bedroom and told Joey that Lim deserved to die, as he had gone too far and it was Lim's fault over whatever personal issues he had with Lim. Tun also threatened Joey not to report him or he will come back to kill her and her family. He then fled to the car park and hopped in on Chui's car and instructed him to drive. When the car went past the canal in Sinkong, Tun asked Ah Chui to pull over as he wanted to dispose the murder weapon. He then threw the gun into the river. They went back to James's house to meet Mo Tang. Tun and Mo Tang fled to Malaysia. At Lim's house, the three ladies managed to free themselves, but they were devastated by the murder scene. They were so lost. 
After a while Joey managed to get back her consciousness and made a call to Lem's sister who lived a few units away. When Lem's mother and sister arrived, they called the police. The police immediately started an international manhunt for Tun. The incident was quickly covered by all local media and the news shocked the nation. As Tun's right eye is blind, the media dubbed him as One-Eyed Dragon. Tun fled to Johor Bahru with Motang in a proton wire. When they were in Johor, Tun and Motang split up. Tun went to have a crew cut to change his appearance before calling on a gang lord in the town. Little did Tun know that the gang lord was already being watched by the Malaysian police. When the police spotted Tun, they started trailing him as well and soon realized that he was the one wanted by the Singapore police. In Malaysia, Tun created a plan to flee to Chiang Mai in Thailand via land. He spent the next few days staying in cheap places to keep a low profile to avoid detection. Tun and his gang were clever enough to switch hotels at least once every two days. On February 25th, 2006, 10 days after the murder, feeling enough for staying in cheap places, Tun decided to check into a five-star hotel, Grand Plaza Park Royal in Kuala Lumpur. When he was there, he went to procure a fake passport under his alias Tony Kia. Little did he know that from the first day he fled to Malaysia, the Malaysian police were already on his trail. When the Malaysian police saw him checked into Grand Plaza Park Royal, they went to the hotel to monitor his movements, with a plan to capture him. At around midnight, Tun, who was together with his wife and four others in one of the three rooms they booked, craved for some Hainanese chicken rice, so he ordered the Hainanese chicken rice through room service. He definitely did not know that his craving of Hainanese chicken rice created a perfect opportunity for the cops to capture him. An undercover Malaysian cop posed as a waiter and delivered the food to Tun's room on the 13th floor. He used the chance to gather intel. He scanned the room's layout and how many were with Tun. He saw Tun's wife, Sio, and two other couples. A listening device was stuck on one of the dishes. At 2 a.m., when the other two couples returned to their beds in adjoining rooms. Two hours later on February 25th, when nothing but snores could be heard, 12 officers rushed into the three rooms. Tun's room was clean. But in the others, police found six guns, 203 bullets, two pairs of handcuffs, and four kilograms of ketamine. On March 1st, Tun was brought back to Singapore to face the murder charge. Although Tun was captured, but the prosecution was facing a challenge to charge Tun with first-degree murder, the prosecutor had to prove there was an intention to kill. This could give Tun a chance to defend himself with no intention to kill. In Singapore, 33 offenses including murdering, drug trafficking, terrorism, use of firearms, and kidnapping warrants the death penalty. As such, the prosecutor decided to dismiss the murder charge and instead proceed with a fresh charge of an unlawful discharge of a firearm with the intention to cause death or hurt which carried the same death penalty. Illegal discharge of firearm would mean regardless of whether Tun suffered from abnormality of mind or not, and regardless of whether he killed accidentally or not, Tun would still be found guilty and face the death penalty. The prosecutor just need to prove that Tun indeed illegally firing a gun. Before the start of the trial, despite having such a serious sentence on his head, Tun insisted he did not want any lawyer to represent him even though he could have asked the court to assign him to under the term pro bono, making him the first person to defend himself against a capital charge since the previous 16 years. During the trial, Tun was full of confidence when he began, often seen laughing and joking with the guards, even giving the thumbs up to his friends seated in the public gallery. When he got a satisfactory answer from a witness, he would wink and smile at his wife. In the trial, Tun claimed that he only wanted to scare Lim as he feared that Lim might send someone to kill him. In his defense, he claimed that he actually fired the shots in self-defense when Lim allegedly raised a chair and charged at him with an attempt to attack him. He also claimed that the gun had misfired and the death was caused by an accident. To dismiss his responsibility, Tun said he had drunk some alcohol with his friends prior to the attack and had been intoxicated with alcohol when he killed Lim, 
This was to argue that his mental responsibility was impaired. But many of his arguments fell flat. The prosecution noted that Lim would not have been able to lift a bulky chair since he had been tied up. Weapons specialist David Liu from the police's armament branch testified that the gun could not have gone off on its own since David was able to test fire the gun without any malfunctions. A senior consultant psychiatrist, Dr. Minadesa Winslow, was called by Tun as his defense witness on how alcohol could have affected his mental state. But Dr. Munidesa Winslow testified that even though Tun was possibly drunk at the time, it did not affect his mental responsibility for the shooting. In a surprise move before the trial ended, Tun urged the court to hang him. He claimed that his wife was receiving threatening text messages. He was willing to die to protect his wife. He said, I don't want to fight. I want to surrender. I don't want to get my wife into trouble. His wife, CO, even showed reporters the messages later that day. One said, if your husband doesn't die, you'll have to die. Deputy Public Prosecutor Chu Ching Yi described Tun's testimony as untruthful, evasive, and at times so ludicrous it only reinforced his guilt. Close to the end of the trial, Tun seemed to realize he had made a foolhardy decision in rejecting proper representation. When Justice Tay asked Tun if he needed anything to prepare for closing submissions, Tun replied, If I say I need a lawyer now, how? When closing the trial, the High Court rejected Tun's defense of being drunk, accidentally firing the shots, and acting in self-defense. Justice Tay Yong Kwang labeled his actions as those of an assured and accomplished assassin and sentenced him to death. After the verdict, Tun appointed a top lawyer to represent him in his appeal. In January 2008, the three-judge panel turned down the appeal. After the loss of his appeal, Tun only left with one option. His final appeal was to petition to the President of Singapore to plead for clemency, which would allow Tun's death sentence to be reduced to life imprisonment if successful. But the appeal was dismissed by the President of Singapore on January 5, 2009. Before facing the noose, Tun put up a request for his kidneys, liver, and cornea to be donated. At dawn, January 9, 2009, Tun was hanged. What do you think about this case? Two lives were lost due to a stupidity of anger and ego. A husband and father was taken away from a family, no matter what goodness Tun did. It cannot bring back the broken family of Lim. Joey and her daughter have to undergo a terrible time of suffering. Lim's daughter deserves to grow up with a complete family and have a happy childhood. Sadly, it was brutally taken away from her. Whenever I read about a murder story, I always feel sorry to the victim's family. I wish Joey and her daughter all the best and hope they have already overcome the grief of losing their loved ones. Leave your comments below and let me know your thoughts about this case. I will wrap up this case and thanks for being here. Until my next video, take care and be there for your loved ones. Goodbye.